So what I'm going to tell you about is uh, essentially some of the activities that we've been doing in Florence in the last uh, 10, 15 years, more or less. And uh, so I'm going to start with some um, short outline where I'm going to tell you what, uh, what we do and what I want what to tell you, how we do it and why we do it. So what we do and what I'm going to tell you about today is uh, that we want to generate, manipulate and detect non-classical states of light in uh, arbitrary modes. And I'm going to explain later what, what I mean by this. How we do it is uh, by means of uh, some single photon level operations. So the ability to really manipulate light at the level of a single photons uh, in a mode selective way, again, and I, this, this is going to be more clear in the, in the following. And we use homodyne detection for, let's say, measuring and characterizing the states of light that we produce. Uh, why we do it? And uh, so why the main motivation is because it's uh, uh, interesting from a fundamental point of view, from the fundamental, let's say, physics, physical point of, point of view. And also because uh, what we are doing uh, maybe will become a new resource for quantum technologies. So in particular, I'm going to, to, to show you how we can implement in the lab a very simple, basic quantum, uh, uh, let's say, the basic tools, the basic bricks of quantum uh, mechanics. So something like single uh, excitations, the creation and annihilation operators. We can implement something which is really the commutator relation uh, experimentally in the lab. And uh, so and all this stuff, uh, besides being interesting from a fundamental point of view, can also be, let's say, mixed together. It can become the, the, the bricks of sort of LIGO to essentially manipulate manipulate quantum states of light and generate something else. So this is just a, uh, an illustration of what we are doing and then again, this will be, become clearer in the next. So let's start from the very beginning. So if uh, we want to generate, uh, let's say, non-classical states of light, we have to measure light at the quantum level. Uh, so how we do it? Well, uh, again, so let's first see how we can describe it. So in a classical picture of light, uh, you can, if you have a classical sinusoidal electromagnetic wave, you can define it as a point in phase space, okay? Where you have a field amplitude, a phase, and that's all. So if it's a stable uh, monochromatic wave, this is a, a way to describe it. If you have classical noise and fluctuation, then you may have some, some let's say, fluctuation of this point. And so what you can do is to define some probability distribution in this uh, phase space uh, where the, the, uh, let's say the uh, coordinates are the so-called field quadratures. And uh, this is, a, in the classical case, this is a probability distribution. So it's positive, it's normalized, and it has a property that uh, if you project it in a given direction, that will give you the probability, probability of the amplitude of a field at uh, a particular phase. Okay, so this is for a classical case. So the projection of this uh, probability distribution in any direction will give you uh, the uh, distribution of the field amplitude at a given phase. In the quantum case, uh, as you already know, you cannot define uh, uh, measure amplitude and phase of the field at the same time. So there is uh, Heisenberg's uh, uncertainty principle. So the probability of a point in a phase space does not make sense. But still, you can define this uh, sort of uh, uh, this distribution, which is now called the Wigner function, which is no longer a probability distribution, distribution because it is, uh, I mean, it is not defi positive uh, defined, so it can become negative sometimes. But still, it has the same nice property that uh, if you project it in any uh, direction, at any angle, that will give you the probability uh, distribution of the field amplitude, amplitude at that particular, uh, let's say, phase, okay? This is set in very, let's say, simple rough terms. Uh, so what we want to do is to really try to, uh, if we want to characterize this quantum state of light, we want to, to, to find this Wigner function of a state. Uh, how can you measure it? Uh, so, 
if you measure it, I mean, you, if you add this Wigner function, that will give you the full information about the state. So how to measure it? Uh, it cannot be measured directly, but you can exploit some uh, uh, of its properties. So for example, that its projections are something that you can measure uh, in principle. So what you need to do is to essentially measure uh, this field amplitude, amplitude distribution at different phases. So you need to be able to measure the distribution of the field amplitude at a given phase. How can you do it? So you need some, something which is phase sensitive, and so you need some interferometric method. And the interferometric method that we use is uh, balanced modern detection. Okay, so probably you have, uh, most of you have already heard about it, uh, but anyway, so what you do, you take the state of light that you want to measure, and you mix it on a 50% mean speed okay. with a local oscillator, which is a strong, uh, let's say, uh, classical uh, beam of light, and then you take the outputs of, a two, of this beam splitter and you send them to two proportional photodiodes and take the difference in the photocurrent between these two photodetectors. Then I skip all the calculations, but what you get at the end here, this uh, difference uh, photocurrent is proportional to the quadrature of this uh, unknown, sorry, unknown field at the phase which is set by the local oscillator phase. Okay? So if you do this, you can, every time you do this, you measure one quadrature value. So you can set this phase and measure a set of quadrature uh, distributions, and we give you one of these uh, distributions here, which is just one of these projections, okay? Then you can repeat the measurement, me measurement, sorry. You change the phase, so you look at a different angle, you acquire another set of measurements, and this is a data projection of this, uh, Wigner function that in principle you cannot measure directly. But you can measure all these uh, projections. So what you can do in the end is something analogous to what you do in uh, medicine. So you take many two-dimensional uh, pictures at different angles and then you can reconstruct a three-dimensional picture. So you can do the same or something similar in this case. And uh, so what you can do is to really, so what you can do directly is uh, to apply this sort of geometrical uh, transformation, which is called the inverse radon transform, transform, and really directly from your homodyne data, you can obtain your Wigner function. Uh, there are better ways of doing this, doing it. So, for example, you can instead of going to the Wigner function, you can apply other methods like maximum likelihood or pattern function or other approaches uh, exist also. Instead of measuring, uh, sorry, reconstructing the Wigner function, you can first reconstruct the density matrix of the state in the FOC basis, for example. And uh, these two descriptions are completely equivalent. So if you can get this, you can, you can obtain the Wigner function, or if you obtain the Wigner function, you can get the density matrix of the state, and that will give you the full information about the state of light, okay? So this is a basic, uh, let's say, background to understand what's coming next. So these are the Wigner functions for some, say, uh, usual classical states of light. So classical depends on what you call by classical anyway. So for a vacuum state, this is uh, the Wigner function is just a Gaussian uh, at the origin. So if you measure quadrature values, so these are experimental uh, measurements of the quadratures at different values of the phase, so you see that they're, well, you don't see probably, but anyway, so they're just uh, scattered uh, around the zero. So whatever, from any direct direction you look at this one, you always get zero with some distribution of, uh, let's say, noise. A coherent state, which is what comes out of, uh, of a laser, is the same as a vacuum state, but just displaced from the origin, which means that if you measure these quadratures and, and, the, and the width of this Gaussian is just, uh, the same independently of uh, how far it is from the origin, which means whatever the amplitude of the green state, its fluctuations are always the same. So for a small, let's say, green state, for, you see a strong noise contribution, but if you go to larger amplitude, this just behaves like essentially just a classical wave, okay? And this is a thermal state of light, which has uh, just uh, uh, still a Gaussian uh, Wigner function around the origin, so which means that it has no definite phase, and uh, okay, and that's it. 
So let's move to something more interesting. So these are big functions of non-classical states. And uh, so these are just uh, a few, let's say, representative non-classical states. So first one is the squeezed vacuum state, which is uh, just, a gauche, uh, just a vacuum state which run where one quadrature has been, uh, so the um, noise in one quadrature has been squeezed and the other one has been, uh, let's say, increased correspondingly. This is a single photo, and uh, if you try to measure this uh, with homo detection, this is what you get. So this is vacuum, and this is squeezed vacuum. So you see that some po in some points, if you look from the right direction, you see that the noise is reduced compared to vacuum. And in some other directions, if you look this way, the noise is uh, increased compared to vacuum. This is a single photon Fox state, and you see that it's uh, symmetrical around the origin, which means that a single photon has no phase, and uh, you don't see it from here, from this picture in particular, but uh, it is the negative in the center, which is a clear, uh, let's say, uh, evidence of the fact that this is a non-classical state because this uh, Wigner function, function is no longer a probability distribution because it becomes negative. And this is a so-called Schrodinger cat state. This is what we call a cat state in optics. Uh, one, of the, one example of a Schrodinger cat state, which is a coherent superposition of two coherent states, so two laser pulses with opposite, sorry, I forgot to show you, which is the uh, um, uh, quadrature distribution of this uh, corresponding to the Fox state. It's uh, something like this. So it's uh, independent of the phase, and it has uh, ideally uh, zero, uh, so uh, in the center. Uh, for a cat state, this is the, uh, the homodyne data that you get. So there are two coherent states, so, but uh, I mean, with opposite phases, okay? So this is just a short uh, overview to, to have an idea of what uh, we are going to, to, to see. So what I'm going to show you in the next, uh, uh, next one hour and uh, 16 minutes are essentially just uh, uh, a collection of uh, Wigner functions of states that we can get uh, uh, by playing with these uh, fundamental bricks, okay? So our main uh, tool to do this is again parametric down conversion. You have already heard about it, so I am not going to repeat it. So we start from, uh, let's say, blue pulses, violet pulses of high energy. High energy. You put a nonlinear crystal and then from time to time you have a, a down conversion event where one single blue photon splits in two and uh, you have to cons conserve energy and momentum. So <clears throat> whenever you see a single photon here, there is also a single photon there, and uh, you can use this to generate single photons in a conditional way. Just a little bit of mathematics. So this is the, uh, the Hamiltonian involved in this uh, parametric process. So you suppose, you, so this is the evolution of the state, you put this Hamiltonian here, and what you get is uh, this. So if you start from some any input state, this is how it, it evolves under this uh, Hamiltonian. And then you can make some, uh, let's say, uh, approximations. So, so suppose that the, uh, the, the gain of the parametric process is uh, very small. So you can approximate this exponential evolution with this. So it just becomes one, so the uh, identity, plus g times g is uh, chi t, which is proportional to the length of a crystal, to the nonlinearity of a crystal, to the power of a pump pulse, of a pump pulses here, times this, uh, times the original state. So let's uh, start with uh, something simple. So let's start from vacuum. So you start, this is the pump, and these are two, the two output modes, uh, which are normally called signal and idler. And suppose we start from vacuum. So you, we don't inject any light. We just send the, the pump and we have vacuum in these two inputs. So if you put this here, what you get is that the first terms just, sorry, the first term just gives you vacuum here and there, which means that most of the time nothing happens. So you don't have any down conversion. But sometimes, and uh, there is, uh, this down commercial process. So, and uh, one single photon is generated in the signal arm, and the other one is generated in the idler arm with this coefficient here. 
and you find that the probability for this process to happen is proportional to this g squared, which will be interesting from, for what I, I say later. And so if you see a single photon here on this, uh, then you just, uh, if you trace on, well, sorry, if you see a single photon in this uh, idler mode, then you're sure that there is a single photon in the uh, signal mode. What is the energy conservation you told that should be energy Sorry, sorry? Energy conservation. Yeah, of course. Because zero is the beginning and why zero is the end? I didn't get it. Sorry? <laughs> you get photon in output. You input yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you don't convert from the pump. Ah, okay. You take, uh, you take the energy from the pump, of course. And uh, so this is uh, a scheme of how it works basic scheme, so you have a laser, usually we use pulsed lasers. Uh, most of the output from the laser is uh, frequency doubled in a nonlinear crystal, and so this is the blue light that we use for down conversion, this is the down conversion crystal. So you have uh, pairs of photons emitted in different directions, one of them is detected by an avalanche photodiode, a single photon detector, and when this detector clicks, we send a signal here, which is the homodyne detector, it tells the homodyne detector to perform a measurement because in that case there is a single photon going this direction and then we mix it with a local oscillator and we perform homodyne measurements. So let's see if it works. So spontaneous parametric conversion you have already seen. Homodyne detection. So you take, we take local oscillator pulses, again coming from the laser, so these are now intense coherent pulses, and we perform measurements, homodyne measurements, so we measure quadrature values only when we get a click from this detector here. So this is a so-called heralded single photon uh, generation schema, okay? So after a while we, okay, forget about this. After a while we can collect many uh, quadrature points and then we can use these uh, tomographic uh, methods to reconstruct either the Wigner function or the density matrix of the state, which are equivalent. Okay, so this is a basic uh, ingredient, and we started doing this already more than 15 years ago, a long time ago. And um, so after a while, we, we started to think, well, okay, we can generate single photons. What else can we do? Well, a single photon is just the application of a photon creation operator on the, on the vacuum. So ideally, we would like to do something more. And uh, so why don't we try to just ex uh, implement this a DAG, I mean, not just on the vacuum, but on uh, any input state. And then you, you can do it easily. Uh, so we can start again from the same scheme, for the same uh, evolution of, of, of the state. We just start from a different uh, input state. Instead of starting from uh, zero, zero here, we can start from vacuum on this uh, idler arm, but we can inject some state of light in this uh, signal arm. So in this case, again, we put it here, and what we get is that most of the time you get, sorry, you get this, so you get the initial state, so the two states, the states just pass through unchanged, but sometimes when you see a single photon here, then what you get on the other side is just G times A dag psi. So what you have obtained here in this mode is just the uh, application, the photon creation operator on the input state in a heralded way, okay? And if you just uh, calculate what is the probability for this process to happen, it's just the same as before, it's, it's okay in G square, but now it's times one plus uh, the mean number of photons in this input state, which is just the uh, Einstein uh, stimulated emission uh, probability which is proportional to the number of photons already existing in that mode. So this is essentially the basic step of uh, uh, stimulated emission, okay? And then you can also use this to, to have an absolute calibration of the mean number of photons in this input mode. Okay, so we, this is uh, the way to essentially implement this uh, photon creation operator. So we just use uh, the parametric down conversion, which is no longer a spontaneous parametric down conversion, but now it's a stimulated parametric down conversion. So we send some light in here, and when we see a click in this detector, what we get in this mode here is the A DAG applied to the input, okay? Again, it, it works with, with some limitations, so you have to start from uh, a uh, small parametric gain and small mean number of photons here, but it, uh, it works rather well otherwise. And this is a schema 
of how to do it. So it's the same scheme as I showed you before, but now we have some, uh, we can inject some light here in this uh, uh, signal mode, which is uh, the light, where, uh, the state of light where we are going to perform this uh, ADAG operation, okay? So let's, uh, let's see what we can apply this uh, ADAG operation to. The first thing you can apply it to is uh, a coherent state. Okay, so these are Wigner functions for a coherent state. As I told you, it's a, it's a Gaussian displaced from the origin, which tells you that it has a rather well-defined intensity and phase. And also, on the opposite side of the spectrum of, uh, let's say, Wigner functions, there is a single photon Wigner function, which is uh, completely phase uh, invariant, and it's negative at the origin. So what happens if you add a single photon, which is, I mean, this photon uh, creation operator just essentially adds a single photon to a coherent state. And what we get, uh, what we expect to get is something which takes some of the properties from the two parents. So it has uh, the phase dependence from the uh, uh, coherent state, but it has the negative values from the Fox state. So this, uh, we call these uh, single photon added coherent states. And uh, so I can show you what I, ah. So, so what, what is nice is that uh, suppose you can perform this photon addition operation. You start from vacuum state and you perform a single photon addition and you get a single photon at the output, of course, okay? If you start from uh, an high amplitude coherent state, so something which is already very close to a wave-like behavior and you add just a single photon, I mean, intuitively you may understand that it's not going to change much. So in this case, you add a single photon, you get something which is still close to a classical wave. So if you now, you can just now turn the, a knob at the input, uh, you can change the attenuation in the coherent state at the input, and so you can move from vacuum to a high amplitude coherent field at the input, and what you get at the output is something which changes in a continuous way between a single photon and uh, a classical wave. So you have a sort of continuous tuning of the non-classicality of the output state. And so this is, uh, oops, can I stop it somewhere? Yeah, so you see this is, a, uh, this is the Wigner function of the photon added coherent state depending on the amplitude of the input uh, uh, coherent state. So if you start from uh, uh, from vacuum, you get the, so now the origin is, uh, is here, okay? So if you start from vacuum, you get a single photon, and uh, if you start to increase, uh, you get something which is uh, deformed, and uh, if you have, you go to a large input coherent state, the result of the application of a single photon, of a single uh, photon addition is still very similar to a coherent state, okay? So we can do the measurement. We did the measurements a long time ago. We start with different uh, amplitudes at the input. input. And uh, by adding single photons, so you get uh, something which, is, which pass, moves uh, continuously from uh, essentially a, a particle behavior, which is this one, to a wave-like behavior, which is this one. And these are the resulting uh, Wigner functions, which move uh, for, from uh, a Fox state to essentially a coherent state. Okay, um, so we can also add single photons, perform photon addition to some, to, to, to some other states. And for example, we can add a single photon to, to just thermal light, very, let's say, very classical uh, light, I would say. So you can just think of uh, taking sunlight, adding a single photon, and see what comes out. Unfortunately, it's not so easy to, to work with sunlight because uh, the mean number of photons in a particular mode is very small. So with what we use is this uh, pseudo-thermal light source, uh, which is just uh, what comes out of a rotating disk uh, where your laser beam is it's pinching. You just take a single mode fiber so that you have a nice uh, single spatial mode, but the amplitude and the phase of, uh, of the field are uh, randomized. So this is a good approximation of, um, of a thermal state of light. And, and this is what we expect. So, okay, forget the formula. So this is the Wigner function for the resulting state that when you apply uh, 
uh, photon addition to a thermal state of light. So you start again, so this is, a, you cannot say, see it from here, but this is a mean number of photon, photons in this uh, thermal state. So in this case it's zero, and again, so it's vacuum, and you add the single photon, and this is just a big function of a single photon. But if you, uh, let's see where it is. So if you start from a larger um, thermal state, and you add the single photon, then the distribution okay, <laughs> flattens, but still, uh, you cannot see from here, but it's still negative at the origin. So it means that, and negativity of a big function is a signature of no classical behavior. So it means that just the application of a single photon addition turns any input state into something which is non-classical, even something which is very classical, I would say, something like a thermal state, by just adding a single photon becomes non-classical. Then it's difficult to measure, but in principle it is non-classical, okay? Um, so we did measurements for thermal states. So these are results of such measurements. So this is a, uh, these are the input bigger uh, functions, and these are the output after you add the single photon. So this is a, a thermal state which has a very low mean photon number, so essentially almost vacuum, and you get a Fox state at the output. And this is a, well, it's still not a very hot thermal state, but this, the mean number of photons is just slightly larger than one. But when you apply a, a, a single photon addition, it becomes negative at the origin. And then you can study the negativity, and you can, we can perform a lot of uh, uh, tests. And these are ideal, let's say, states to, to really see, um, to, to really tune in a continuous way the non-classicality of a state, okay? So this is uh, essentially a photon addition. Essentially it's a process with uh, two input modes and two output modes. One of the input contains vacuum, the other input contains the state that you want to operate on. And the two one of the two output modes is detected by, the, by uh, an on-off detector, okay? And uh, so as I showed you before, if uh, this, um, I change the symbols now, sorry. So if uh, the parametric gain is small enough, then you can approximate the evolution this way and this is what you get, okay? This kind of process is very similar to this process. And in this case, it's a bin splitter now. And again, you, can, uh, you have a vacuum in this input mode, some state in this input mode, and one single photon detector, one off, on off detector in one of the two output modes. So, and you see that also these, uh, let's say, evolution operators are very similar. Indeed, I mean, this is the bin splitter transformation. The only difference is that mm, before lamp, oh, sorry, apart from uh, change here, now this theta is the reflectivity of a bin splitter, okay? But uh, very, everything is very similar, so you can rewrite the evolution of, of the state in just the same way, but now what you get is that uh, because uh, uh, here it's uh, A dag, B dag, and in this case it's A, B dag, when you see a click in this detector, so when you see a photon here, then what you get in this case is A applied to the input state. So if you use a bin splitter with a low reflectivity, what you can get is a conditional uh, implementation of a photon annihilation operator. Okay, this is, uh, so you can use this <laughs> scheme now to subtract single photons. So you start from any state, uh, you have a bit splitter with low reflectivity, when you see a click in this detector, okay. The output state is A applied to the input state, okay? And this is a scheme, you can, how you can do it. And the first time that this scheme was used by, was by the group of Philippe Cranchet in Paris, some years ago, and they applied it to some squeezed vacuum state. And by applying, by subtracting a single photon, what we, they got was a small Schrodinger cat, okay? So something which was much more, let's say, non-classical, okay, in some, <laughs> uh, in some sense, than what they started from, okay? So if a couple of years later, we also started to work on uh, photon subtraction, and then you, we applied it also to, to many different uh, kinds of state. For example, if you apply it to a coherent state, then you can verify that the coherent state is the uh, eigenstate of uh, 
the photon nucleation operator, so A DAG, uh, A, sorry, A alpha is uh, alpha alpha. But you can also find some peculiar results, such as if you apply uh, photon subtraction, so this A operator to a, co a thermal state, what you get is something which, uh, I mean, at, at the beginning was very uh, surprising for us because we didn't <laughs> understand it, but uh, okay, now it's clear. Uh, is that if you apply photon subtraction to a thermal state, what you get is a, a doubling of the mean number of photons in the state instead of uh, what you might expect. And then you, if you keep subtracting photons, then you keep increasing the mean number of photons in the input state. So you get very nice, uh, strange results, uh, interesting. And this is what you get uh, if you uh, perform a single mode of photon subtraction. So you start from a state in a, in a well-defined mode, you subtract a, ph subtract a photon, you can get this. Uh, nice um, results. If you subtract photons in a different way from a two-mode state, for example, this is, uh, if you, so you recognize these are photon subtractions, bin splitter and detectors here. This was a theoretical proposal. Uh, you can increase, uh, uh, for example, entanglement. You can distill entanglement. Okay, and this was a, a proposal to, to increase the uh, fidelity of teleportation by subtracting photons. And again, one of the first experiments was done in the group of Philippe Granchet in Paris again, where they start from an entangled uh, state coming out of a parametric down conversion crystal. So you have the entanglement between these two modes, output modes, and by subtracting a photon from, let's say, in a coherent way from these two modes, they were able to essentially uh, in increase the amount of entanglement at the output. Okay, I'm going to discuss again about this uh, in a while. So, okay, this is our quantum toolbox. So we suppose it's just like a sort of quantum Lego, Lego bricks. So you have uh, photon addition, A DAG, and photon subtraction, A, and they are both working in a conditional way. So you need a click in, in a detector to know that they have been uh, successful, okay? But it's, uh, it's not post-selection. So it's, uh, I mean, if, uh, it, if you see a click, the state is there. I mean, you have prepared the state and you can keep using it, okay? So it's a conditional, it's heralding. So you get a click and it tells you that you can, okay, it's, it's working, so you can keep working on, on, with these states. <clears throat> and um, so I'm going to show them with these uh, cartoons. So block boxes, which have uh, one uh, trigger uh, signal, which tells you that they have been working uh, correctly. Okay. So what can you do with these uh, uh, bricks? For example, you can use for some, let's say, something f to test some fundamental. Uh, basics of uh, quantum mechanics, like com commutation rules. So we have a DAG and A, and uh, instead of using them independently, we can use them uh, in a sequence. So, for example, you can put these three boxes in a sequence, and then not just look at the single clicks from each of these boxes, but you can look at coincidences, uh, for example, for between these two. If you see a click from these two detectors, then you have implemented with A ADAG operations, so first ADAG and then A on the input state, okay? But if you look at clicks from these two, then uh, you had implemented the reverse sequence, so ADAG A. So immediately what you can do is to try to test uh, if uh, commutation, quantum commutation rules work. So you can start with the same input state and look at the outputs with these two different uh, uh, sequences. And then you can test whether a, a DAG, the commutator of A, a DAG is uh, equal to zero or not. We know that they don't commute, so we expect that the two uh, operations, <coughs> these two different operations have different results. And we indeed performed the experiment again a long time ago. And we, you can recognize now these bricks. So this is the first photon subtraction. This is a photon addition, and this is another photon subtraction. So depending on which pairs of detectors click, you can implement either A, A DAG, or A DAG A on the same input state. That in this case was again a thermal state of light, okay? And you can measure what comes out. 
So you can compare the results of these two different uh, sequences of operations. And what we found was, uh, okay, so just look at these two here. So this is the input state. So these are just uh, raw, uh, raw measurements, results from raw measurements. So this is the a quadrature distribution from the input thermal state. Okay, so it's a Gaussian like this. If you apply these uh, AA DAG operations, so first uh, uh, a photon addition and then a photon subtraction, this is the uh, quadrature distribution of the output state. And if you apply the reverse operation, this is something completely different. So immediately by looking at this, I mean, this, by comparing these two, we immediately see that, uh, okay, AA and ADAG do not commute. Okay, so this is nice from the fundamental point of view. Can you do something useful also out of it? Well, uh, for example, what you can do is to implement something which is called noise noiseless amplification. Uh, <clears throat> so suppose we just start from a, a sequence of A DAG and A, okay? And we apply this sequence to a coherent state. So if a, if a coherent state is small enough, uh, then you can just uh, forget about uh, all the other terms in the expansion in a Fox state and just keep the first two. So zero plus alpha one, okay? This is, this is a very weak coherent state, okay? What happens if you apply this AA DAG sequence to, the, to this coherent state? Then you can just, uh, this is very simple. So it's zero plus one, the first photon, sorry, the first photon uh, addition brings zero to one and the one to two with this square root of two here. And then you apply this photon uh, subtraction. So one goes back to zero, two goes back to one, but there is an additional square root of two here. And so what you end up is uh, you start from zero plus alpha one and you end up with zero plus two alpha one, which is uh, approximately a coherent state with, uh, which, with uh, a double amplitude, okay? And uh, so the final state is a coherent state of double amplitude. Why is this interesting or, let's say, puzzling? It's, uh, suppose that you have a, so these are two coherent states, okay? Suppose you are encoding information in a coherent state uh, in the, let's say, in the phase of these two coherent states or you want to measure something based on these coherent states. If you are like this, then it's, uh, it's okay. But if you start to have losses or something, then these two coherent states go back towards vacuum and so they start to overlap and you cannot distinguish them any, anymore and so on. So what you would like to do, you would like to reverse this process and go back to the initial situation. And so you would like to have something like this, some process which takes you from alpha to G alpha, which is an amplifier. And it should be a noiseless amplifier, should, sorry, should be uh, independent of the input state. So it should amplify anything independently of its phase and so on. But you immediately see that this process is not, uh, is not allowed by quantum mechanics because it would allow you to clone states, uh, which is impossible. Uh, according to no cloning theorem, uh, you would be, be able to beat Heisenberg uncertainties and so on. So this process is not possible because every time you try to amplify a coherent state, you unavoidably add noise and you end up with something which is even more noisy than what you started from. So what is this uh, noiseless amplifier that, uh, how can the noiseless amplifier that I showed you be, uh, before work? Well, it works because it, uh, it's working in a non-deterministic way. It doesn't work all the time, okay? It works only when you, these uh, clicks uh, happen. So uh, the uh, no cloning theory, theorem and the uh, impossibility of uh, amplifying uh, a state in a noiseless way is only, mm, sorry, it's impossible uh, in a deterministic way. But if you use a non-deterministic way, so you can do, you can, this process is legal. So you can have a perfect amplification only in a, a, a subset of all the, your, let's say, uh, measurements. <coughs> But so, but it, so you can do it in a uh, in a heralded way. So heralded uh, heralded noiseless amplification is possible, and this is indeed what we have done. So we call this uh, the hi-fi noiseless amplifier because essentially it can amplify uh, coherent states with very low uh, noise. 
uh, unfortunately it works only for weak coherent states and it works in a non-deterministic way so it doesn't work all the time but when it works it works essentially perfectly okay so let's go on so uh, let's go back to fundamental uh, quantum mechanics so before I showed you that these two processes uh, give different results uh, so what if we wanted to to really implement the full computational relations. So to really prove that this is the identity. So A, A dag minus A dag A is uh, uh, the identity. So if you want to do this, uh, instead of just being able, uh, being able to, to perform sequences, you also want to perform coherent superposition of the different, uh, of these different bricks, okay? So you want to implement this minus uh, between these two uh, bricks. So how can we do it? And uh, so, if you start from these bricks, uh, a clear superposition of these two operations can be done by essentially combining the herald uh, uh, signals from these uh, different operators. It can be anything this way on a beam splitter and look at uh, just that one output. If you see a click in this detector now, because of, uh, of course, of uh, indistinguishability of uh, the origin uh, of this uh, click, what you are I have to admit, I mean, so this beam splitter essentially erases the information about the origin of the click in this detector. So what you get is an arbitrary superposition of these two operators, A and B. And if you put a phase here, you, can, you also have a, a, an arbitrary phase between these two operations. So this is a, a general concept, and if you can apply it to the, to the scheme I showed you before, we can modify it slightly this way. So this is again a sequence of uh, subtraction, addition and subtraction again, but now we don't look at just directly coincidences, we look at coincidence between the uh, addition here, so if we see a, need a click from this detector, and we a click from this detector here. So if we see a click from this detector, we know for sure that there was one photon subtraction taking place, but we erase the information whether it was from the first or the second uh, annihilation box. Okay, so in this case, if you see a coincidence here between these two detectors, this is the general operation that you perform. So it's a, it's a coherent superposition with an arbitrary, sorry, with an arbitrary phase and arbitrary weights, which are just given by the reflectivity of this mean splitter between these two inverse sequences, okay? So in particular, if uh, this is a 50% beam splitter, then there are equal weights and you can implement this operation and then you can set this phase to pi no sorry to zero <laughs> uh, to zero and then if you set the phase right you can really so this scheme is equivalent to a commutator it's a commutator between a and a dag okay so we first thought about about this scheme and then we performed the experiment and in, and this is how it looks like so again, it's the same as before. So we, we have a photon subtraction, we have a photon addition, and we have another photon subtraction. But this time we connect the outputs from the two photon subtraction, subtractions with, a, with an adjustable phase here. And we look at coincidence between this detector here and this detector here from the photon addition. So if we see a click, a coincident click, then we, can, we have implemented this operation and we can look and we can change with a relative phase here. So we can essentially start from, a, again, we start again from a thermal state. And if uh, we set the phase right here equal to zero, then we can implement the commutator, so A, A dag minus A dag A. And what we, and these are experimental results. So this is the input state and this is the final state. And you see that it's the same. So we really implemented the identity, which means we, that A, A dag minus A dag A is equal to one. But if you set the wrong phase, if you set the phase equal to pi, then you implement the anti-commutator, and you get something which is completely different, and it's not inter interesting at this, at this point. Okay. So we have already heard about, uh, so how can we use this, uh, this stuff for something which may be useful, apart from being interesting? Uh, so you have already heard about classical bits, and you have already about heard about qubits, and these are, this is a typical discrete variable qubit, 
where the basis is uh, 0 and 1, so you, normally the basis is, uh, um, is uh, sorry, uh, binary. Uh, base uh, essentially depending on the presence or absence of uh, single photons in a particular mode, and you normally measure it with clicks. Uh, you can also encode a qubit in uh, discrete in continuous variables, and in, in this case, the, your basis state can be instead of zero or, or and one, it can be alpha and minus alpha, so a coherent state and a coherent state with the opposite phase. In this case, I mean. It, both schemes have uh, advantages and disadvantages. But you use different measurements uh, to, 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 to work with that. In one case, you count clicks. In the other case, you use homogen detection to measure quadratures. Okay? Uh, in some cases, this continuous variable uh, qubit have some uh, advantage. And this is one of the, let's say, most uh, standard ways of uh, defining a qubit. So this is a superposition between, between a coherent state and a coherent state with the opposite phase. Ideally, you would like to have something a bit more general than this. So you would like these two states to be uh, completely uh, orthogonal to each other. So ideally, you, you would like to start from a psi state, build the orthogonal state, psi star, uh, psi orthogonal, this way. And uh, so this would be the most general case. And it would, well, this only works with, uh, when alpha is large enough, so that, I mean, there is uh, the overlap between alpha and minus alpha is small. In this case, this is uh, orthogonal by definition, because uh, you, you build them to be orthogonal. So you would like to, to, to build something like this, OK? So you, we, would, we would like to start from any state of light, psi build an orthogonal state, and then build a coherent superposition of the two to, to build the most general continuous variable qubit. So we would need uh, some orthogonalized, orthogonalized, oh, sorry, orthogonalization operation, OK? Again, uh, like the cloning that I showed you before, this is not allowed by quantum mechanics. So you cannot build a perfect uh, orthogonalizer. But we can do something, let's say, approximate. And this comes from an idea of this uh, paper with Myung Shik Kim from uh, uh, Imperial College. So the idea is that you can build an approximate orthogonalizer for quantum states of light. And uh, so you, the idea is that, and this is this uh, OC operator, uh, and how to build it. The way to build it is uh, you take an arbitrary operator, C, anything, and you build this uh, coherent superposition of C and the uh, identity with a weight which is just given by the mean value of this operator on the input state. So you don't need to, to, to know it, the input state, but you just need to know the mean value of this uh, operation, operator C on the input state. So you don't need full information about the state. You just need uh, some limited information about uh, the input state to orthogonalize, orthogonalize it. Okay? And then you can easily see if this is just uh, trivial. <laughs> Uh, but uh, this operation applied to psi is orthogonal, uh, gives you something which is orthogonal to psi, okay? Uh, so we only need very limited, uh, let's say, information about the input psi to build this uh, orthogonalizer, okay? So some, let, 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 let's try to, to build this orthogonalizer. So we need as I showed you, we need some operator, and we need some, the mean value of the operator on the input states, okay? So suppose that the operator is a photon number, n, and the mean, uh, the mean number of photons in a state is something that you can easily measure. So you don't need the full information about, uh, on, on the state. You don't need a full, let's say, uh, tomography of a state to, to, to measure the mean number of photons, okay? So this is an information that you can easily get by just a photo, a photo detector, okay? So what you can do is you can try to build the orthogonalizer based on the, mean, on the photon number operator. So what you have to do is to build this operation, which is the photon number operator minus the identity times this uh, mean number of photons. Okay, so, sorry, this is the most, uh, complex part of my talk, but uh, so, uh, sorry. Um, so what you can do, you can, 
we can use the schema that I showed you before for uh, testing commutation relations, okay? This is just drawn differently, but this is the first uh, annihilation, this is the second annihilation, this is a photon addition, okay? These are the two detectors, and this is the coincidence, okay? So I showed you before that you can essentially implement this kind of uh, uh, operations. But then, now we, we know that uh, uh, commutation rules work, and we also know the definition of the, mean, of the photon number operator, so you can just transform this this way, rewrite it this way, and then this, now you see that this is just what you want, essentially. It's a coherent superposition of a photon number operator and the identity operator, which is like this. So you can just play with these coefficients here to get exactly this form. And these coefficients are just given by of this beam splitter and this phase that you can just set by turning wave plates in, in the lab. Okay, so you can do this uh, and uh, we can start and now. What we do now, we start again from coherent states. We do this, uh, we just need to know the mean number of photons in this coherent state, so this number here, and then we can adjust our setup. And this is the input state, so these are quadrature data, and this is the Wigner function of the input, so a coherent state. And if you apply the measurement, so you, when, you, when this detector click in coincidence, what you get at the output is this one. So this is the orthogonal state to the input coherent state. And uh, so, so it works. And then you can go one step further. So you, you have, uh, starting from a, a given psi, you have built psi orthogonal. And then you want to do some qubit out of it. So what you want to do is to build something like this. Now I just uh, skip all the normalization and so on. So you want to build psi plus psi orthogonal with some coefficients, okay? So you can rewrite it psi identity plus the orthogonal eyes are applied to the input state. And uh, if you just put this uh, expression in, you see that in the end, this uh, qubit generator now has exactly the same form as the tokenizer. You just change this uh, number. This is just a number here, okay? So what, you, what it means is uh, if you can implement the tokenizer, you can implement by just changing, I mean, it's just the same experimental setup. You just change uh, some uh, parameters in your setup. You just change this coefficient here. You can implement the qubit generator in uh, straightforward way. And so again, we did this uh, with the same uh, setup. We just changed a little bit the parameters. So, so instead of using this number here, we set something slightly different. And, by, and what we can do, we can essentially implement all this, this is just a, a test, so just all these qubits made of a alpha and alpha orthogonal, so with different phases. Okay. So, and so well, what, I, what we have done essentially was is something that starting from a psi, from like, uh, an arbitrary state, uh, brings you to a qubit made of uh, this initial state and the orthogonal to it. So this is a sort of a Schrodinger's machine, which uh, instead of working with uh, just with, so this is a, a picture I showed you at the big beginning. We start from some state and we end up with uh, a superposition of the state and, uh, and it's orth orthogonal. So it's a sort of Schrodinger machine, uh, pet machine, because uh, now it doesn't work only with cats. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't start with a cat and build a, a superposition of a dead and a live cat, but it can work with uh, essentially anything you, 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 you send in. This is a bit exaggerated, but uh, in principle it works in a sort of a universal way. You just need to, to know a very limited amount of information about your input state, okay? So let's, uh, how much time? Oh, okay. So I've shown you that we can add and uh, subtract photons. Uh, can we compare these two operations and see which is better, more useful, more powerful? Well, they're both nice. So photon subtraction is cool because as I've shown you before, you start from something which is non-classical like the vacuum, uh, squeeze vacuum state. You apply A and you get something which is more non-classical. You get some negative Wigner function, like a cat state. You can start with something which is entangled, and by performing a coherent photon subtraction in these two modes, you can get something which is more entangled. So, great. You can 
it works very well, but it cannot generate non-classicality and entanglement by itself. So you need to start from something which is already non-classical or already entangled, and then you can improve it in some sense, okay? So, photon subtraction is cool, but photon addition is probably, is better maybe in this sense, because it can, if you start from a single mode, you can start from any classical, any state also classical, as I've shown you before, and by applying a DAG you can make it non-classical. So what we may expect if, if, is if you start from something, some things, sorry, I'm getting tired. If you start from two modes and which are not entangled, which are not correlated, and you apply a coherent superposition of photon additions in these two modes, then you can get entanglement out of it. So it can create no classicality and entanglement from scratch. So how can we do it? So this is a very uh, a variation of a, of a scheme I showed you before for the coherent superposition of operations. Before I did it on the same mode, so it was the same state passing through uh, different uh, boxes. Now what we can do it is to have two of these boxes on two different modes, let's say, so two different beams. And uh, so what you can do, so this is a DAG, so this is just a parametric down-conversion crystals, so I don't, don't draw the, the pump or nothing, just these are the herald modes of the two uh, down-conversions. What you can do is uh, mix uh, these herald modes on a beam splitter and look at uh, one detector at the output. So if you see that, let's start from something simple, vacuum, vacuum, okay? If you say click here, then uh, there are two possibilities for this, uh, and it could have come from this detector, and in this case at the this mode and vacuum still in the other mode, but it could also come from the other detector, and you have no way to distinguish these two uh, origins. And in this case, you have uh, in this case you have a single photon now in this mode and vacuum still in the other in the first one. So if you cannot distinguish, then you have a coherent superposition of these two, and you have a single photon path entangled state. So you have entangled you have entangled these two modes. Now this is a sort of entanglement which is different from what uh, you have seen before. It's not entanglement between two different photons. It's entanglement between two modes. So two beams sorry, two modes, again, <laughs> two modes, which get entangled by sharing a single photon, single photon, okay? Uh, okay, this is nice, but it's not so useful because you can get the same by just shining a single photon on a 50% bit splitter. If you do it, you get essentially a superposition of a photon being uh, reflected or transmitted, and you have entangled these two modes, again, by sharing a single photon. So you have one, zero, zero, one, uh, situation, okay? So, but uh, maybe we can use the scheme that I showed you before to, to, to do something more. So not just entangling, just uh, uh, a single mode, uh, sorry, a single photon uh, path entangled state, but something more interesting. So for example, we can take the scheme and go one step further. So we can keep, keep vacuum here and get some coherent state here. Again, we do the same. We look at clicks from this detector. It can, they can come from this box, and in this case, it's, it will be one photon here and the same green state on this one. But it could come from this one, and in this case, the, say, the input state, a DAG, the input green state here. And as I shown you at the beginning, uh, if you add a, a single photon to a coherent state with a large uh, enough amplitude, then what you get is still something very similar to a coherent state with a slightly larger amplitude, okay? So this is a sort of alpha prime. And again, if you cannot distinguish between these two options, then you have a, a coherent superposition of them, so these two states are entangled, and this is the kind of output state. So it's one alpha, zero alpha prime, okay? Plus zero alpha prime. Then what you can do is uh, you can just manipulate it slightly so we can perform a, a displacement in phase space, uh, which is uh, something that uh, I don't remember, maybe, uh, well, I don't remember who told about, uh, say, it's something that you can do in the lab. So you can, instead of uh, going from alpha, alpha prime, you can go to alpha minus alpha, and you get this kind of state. And uh, why is this interesting? 
because we, we called it uh, hybrid entangled state of light. So it, it's interesting, again, for two different uh, reasons. One is for sort of fundamental, and the other one is the sort of uh, application-oriented. Application fundamental, so I told you about Schrodinger cats, uh, and uh, in optics, I said, so this is a cat state, uh, a superposition of light and dead cat, like, but you can write it, you can write this way. In optics, uh, this is the equivalent, so it's a, it's a superposition of a, a coherent state and an equivalent state with the opposite phase, what you can essentially, let's say, draw like this, okay? But if you, you, you don't want to deal with this, you want the, the real, let's say, Schrodinger uh, interesting part is this one, is where you get the entangled state between the cat and the, and the radioactive atom. And in this case, so the state is uh, something like this. So you have, uh, it's an entangled state between the microscopic part, which is the atom, which is uh, either excited and then the cat is still alive, or in the ground state and the cat is dead. If you do it, translate it into, let's say, optical terms, the corresponding state is something like this, which is the kind of state that we can generate. So it's made of a part which is uh, discrete, this one, the sort of, let's say, the microscopic part, I would say, which is either zero or one, so the presence or absence of a, a single photon in one mode, which is entangled to two coherent states, again, uh, and this is the reason for, for the picture I showed you before. So you have entanglement between sort of dichotomic uh, uh, state, zero, uh, the presence or absence of a single photon, and something which is made of a, a continuous uh, um, variable state, which is alpha and minus alpha. So this is interesting from a sort of fundamental point of view. And uh, why can it be interesting also from the application point of view? As I showed you before, you can have these diff different encodings for quantum information, uh, for quantum processing and quantum computing, uh, either the discrete or the continuous variable encoding. And uh, if you would, I, I, some of them has an advantage in, for something, and some, some others is advantages for some, something else. But you could, would like to take the best of these two words, and you can do it with this kind of states again. So if w this one connects a, a discrete variable qubit, 0, 1, with a continuous variable qubit. So in principle, you can use these uh, hybrid entangled states to, to interface between different kinds of uh, uh, encoding for quantum information. And people are already starting to, to use this to, to teleport a discrete variable qubit to a continuous variable qubit and vice versa. Okay, let's go even further. And uh, so I showed you, I started from zero, zero, then I moved to zero alpha, and I moved to alpha, alpha. So now this time we start from two coherent states again. And what we do again is perform a delocalized photon addition operation on these two coherent states. So these two coherent states are just uh, uncorrelated, just independent. Uh, you can think of them as the independent uh, laser pulses, weak laser pulses. Then what you can do is to perform a delocalized single photon addition, so coherent addition of a single photon in, on these two modes. And this is what you get. This is an entangled state, so either you have performed a photon addition on the first mode or on the second mode. And you can just uh, work it out, and you can study the entanglement of this state. And uh, you find that the entanglement of this state depends on the, uh, on the superposition, on the kind of superposition of the, this. I mean, this is uh, extreme cases of plus and minus, but you can put a general phase here. And depending on this phase here, the entanglement of the state uh, can uh, either, let's say, decay decay uh, rapidly with the size of the input states or just stay constant. And so for the particular case where there is a minus here, what you get is that the entanglement of the state that you can measure by this MPT, um, essentially, is, oops, sorry. Whew, okay. Uh, the, the entanglement of the state is supposed, ideally, stays constant independent of the size of the input coherent states. So ideally, you can start from large, uh, intense laser beams, 
And just by sharing a single photon between this two sim these two intense uh, laser beams, you can entangle them. Okay, of course, this is just in the ideal case, but we can, and I can show you, uh, let's say, I can show you why, but maybe it's, uh, I don't know if it's, so, because you can rewrite this general state here in this uh, form. And this form is made of two parts. One of them, which is uh, essentially, again, the single photon path entangled state, uh, which is uh, entangled, and then it's just, uh, you just have some displacement on it, which doesn't change the amount of entanglement. And then there is a part which is separable. And uh, you can change the, uh, let's say, amount of separability, separability and entanglement by just adjusting this phase here, this phase in the superposition. So by changing this phase, you can, if you adjust this phase to, 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 to pi, so that this becomes a minus, you only have the entangled part, which uh, stays entangled independent of the size of the input coherent states. Okay, and uh, so this was uh, discussed uh, few years ago by the group of Philippe, uh, Nicolas de Gizenne. And it has also some uh, interesting uh, potential applications because it's, uh, um, this kind of entanglement is, uh, you can entangle again two macroscopic in principle states. Uh, and uh, this is uh, robust to, to photon losses, but it's uh, of course fragile to, to, to phase fluctuations. So let's see how we can do this. Uh, in the lab. Again, so this is, we, we can perform this kind of scheme, but as, uh, I mean, this is just a picture and we are not going to do it, we are not doing it this way in the lab because it requires two uh, parametric down conversion crystals and two of detectors. We don't want to, this is nice, but it's not a very clever solution. So what we can do instead is to do it in a temporal domain. So we use temporal modes instead of two different spatial modes. So the scheme is something that we used the uh, first time several years ago is based on, is based on this. We use just a single photon addition uh, box and uh, we give uh, the herald photon two possible uh, ways to reach the detector, one short way and a long way, okay? So if uh, this detector clicks, uh, there's no way to, to know if it was coming the short way or the long one. And if uh, this delay here is equal to the time delay between the two input modes, then you essentially don't know if you added the single photon to the first or to the second mode. And you essentially entangle with these two uh, temporal wave packet modes, okay? So what you can do with this scheme is to have a coherent superposition of photon addition at two different times. And you, by playing with this phase, you can also change this uh, relative phase. And uh, this scheme is also convenient because you don't need uh, two homodyne detectors, but you can use a single homodyne detector with two uh, phase control local oscillator pulses that you can, so that you can use some time multiplexing to, to perform um, open end detection. And in principle, it, so this is scalable to multiple modes. So we, this is the experiment. Uh, so just going to be quick here. And uh, so you recognize these are two laser pulses coming from the laser, essentially. And this is a photon addition. And you see this is the two different paths for the herald photon to reach the trigger detector. So either a short one or a long one, this is a fiber uh, interferometer, okay? So if this one clicks, uh, then you can, uh, you don't know if you added a single photon to this one or to this one, so you have entangled these two states, and this is exactly the kind of states that we wanted to generate, okay? And uh, so I'm just going to show you the results. So ideally, we would like to have this, uh, as I showed you before, this one to, one and constant with the size of input uh, modes, but experimentally, I mean, nothing is ideal. And so what we get is uh, that this goes down, but nevertheless, even for mean, large mean input photon numbers, so in this case, it's up to 60. So it's uh, the mean photon numbers in this coherent state or in this coherent state is uh, 60. By just adding a single photon this way, you can entangle them in a significant uh, way, and so this is a kind of picture that uh, we, 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 we 
we showed in this case. So just by essentially splitting a single photon between these two, uh, let's say, large green state, you can uh, create a sort of quantum glue to, to entangle them. Of course, this is very fragile, uh, but it can be interesting also because uh, uh, it, since it's so fragile, it can be uh, used in principle to, to, to measure some small phase fluctuations also. And, um, but it's not so fragile in the loss of photons. So you can imagine if you lose a photon from this one, entanglement is still there, okay? Okay, I'm almost at the end, just uh, last uh, maybe 15 minutes, is it correct? <clears throat> so, let's change. So, so far I showed you how we can essentially uh, manipulate the state of light in uh, one or in this last few cases uh, more two essentially fixed well-defined modes. So what we have showed you before is how we can manipulate the Wigner function of the state, okay? And the state has a very well-defined, sorry, it, it lives in a very well-defined mode, okay? So now I'm going to, to, to change, and what I want to do now, we want to keep the state fixed and manipulate the mode, which means we wa I want to manipulate the, essentially the shape of the state, uh, sorry, the shape of the mode where the state lives, okay? So now, from now on, I will just keep uh, the Wigner function constant, so I'm not going to modify the Wigner function, which tells you what the state is, but I'm just manipulating the mode of the state. And I'm going to do it in the simplest uh, non-trivial case, uh, so which is a uh, single photon. Okay, so I will now, from now on, I will just use single photons, and I will not change the state. I will just change the shape of single photon. So what, what, what does it mean? What's the shape of single photon? So uh, I just took this from a, a book, uh, maybe you have heard of it in Russia, uh, uh, Commissario Moltalbano by Camilleri. Maybe there are some movies. Uh, anyway, so this is a writer in Italy, and one of the books is La Forma dell'Acqua, The Shape of Water. So it makes no sense to, to, to measure, to, to, to ask what is the shape of water. And again, it makes no, not much sense to ask what is the shape of single photon, because the shape is given not by the state, but by the mode which, uh, of which uh, the uh, single photon is a single excitation, okay? So a single photon can come in different uh, shapes, and depends on, on, on the mode that you are working with. So if you are just quantizing the field in a cavity, then the single photon is a some, well, some sort of standing wave uh, shape. A monochromatic single photon is something which is infinitely extended in uh, time and space. And uh, what we are dealing with in the lab mostly are just traveling wave packet modes. So our single photons really look like small balls traveling at the speed of light, okay? Um, does it make sense to speak of uh, the shape of single photons? Yes, it does, because uh, uh, if you know the shape of a single photon over a quantum state in general, then you can, uh, for example, optimize their detection. You can uh, optimize the coupling of these quantum states uh, to some atomic memories or some other system. And you can use the shape of these uh, quantum states to encode and detect uh, uh, quantum information in, uh, let's say, you have more dimensions, more, uh, let's say, uh, letters in your alphabet to, to, to encode information with just, uh, for example, a single photon, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, so, so far I just showed you something like this. So a single photon is just uh, the application of photon creation operator on the, on the vacuum. Uh, normally what you do, what, what you mean by this is you're talking about a monochromatic single photon. So you generate a single photon in a, well, uh, a well-defined uh, frequency. Uh, in general, you can define a single photon as a photon uh, creation operation in some let's say, uh, extended way, sorry, so to speak, uh, where your creation operator is, uh, is coherent uh, superposition of a 
creation, monochromatic creation operators with a weight, uh, sorry, with a, yeah, with a weight given by this uh, uh, complex spectral amplitude of the wave packet, okay? So this is, uh, let, 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 let's go on. So how can you control and measure the shape of single photon? So if you generate single photons in a long single photons, so, for example, those which are generated by atomic ensembles with narrow line widths and so on, then they're normally rel relatively long, so of the order of hundreds of nanoseconds or microseconds. So your electronic devices can essentially follow the evolution of a single photon. You can measure at different times and you can reconstruct essentially the time distribution of a single photon. But if you want to do with uh, short, wave packets, so for example what we have in the lab, which are hundreds of femtoseconds or picosecond pulses, then you need to, to do something which is uh, slightly different. You need to use tools which combine ultrafast and quantum optics. And uh, what we can do is to use the properties, of, for example, of homodyne detection. And uh, I, I didn't speak about this before, but what you measure by homodyne detect shown is essentially what the, is a part of a state which lives in, in the mode of a local oscillator, okay? So the homotime detection is only sensitive to the mode of a local oscillator. So if, you <clears throat> if your local oscillator is not matched to the state that you want to measure, essentially you don't see it, okay? In the single photon case, if you don't match the shape of a local oscillator, to the shape of your single photon. Essentially, you don't see the single photon, but you see a mixture of the single photon and vacuum. With this uh, eta coefficient here, which just measure the fraction of a single photon state, which is in the mode of a local oscillator. So if, you, if, your, single, if your local oscillator is perfectly matched, so it has exactly the same temporal profile, spectral profile of your single photons, then the result of homodyne detection and uh, quantum tomography is uh, this bigger function of a single photon. Otherwise, if you don't match it, you can start to lose efficiency and then your bigger function transform gradually to, to, some, to this one and then to vacuum, okay? So what you, you can use this fact to essentially s measure the shape of your single photon. So suppose this is the, the scheme uh, to generate single photons, okay? And again, this is uh, just the uh, same scheme as I showed you before. Spontaneous parametric down conversion, single photons this way, and uh, okay. What you can do is to just measure this quadrature distribution. You have uh, an analytic uh, formula for this, uh, for this quadrature distributions, which depends on this eta coefficient, so the, essentially the which is the efficiency. Suppose that now all the efficiency is given by the matching between your local oscillator, between the shape of your local oscillator and the shape of your single photon. Then you can use, you can fit these uh, experimental curves with this function, extract this eta, and use this eta to shape the local oscillator. So you can change the shape of the local oscillator and then this is a pulse shaper, which is something uh, common in ultrafast optics. And uh, you can really change by manipulating the spectral content of the, of the pulse. You can change the shape of local oscillator to improve, uh, to increase this eta coefficient here. So you can put this in a genetic algorithm, you can put it in a, in a loop, do it in an automatic way. And what you can do is, well, okay, this is just an example we did some, some time ago. So you can start from random local oscillators and then let the algorithm run. And then at the, at the end, you will find that, uh, well, at some point it will converge. So this is the results of, uh, this is this eta coefficient after several generations of this uh, uh, genetic algorithm. And after a while, you see that it more or less converges to the maximum. So starting from scratch, so from really random shapes, so you can, this is just a plot, but I mean, you can start from local oscillators which have crazy shapes. And then automatically, you need no preliminary information. You can just converge to the, to the shape of your uh, single photon. So in principle, you can have uh, any weird shape for your single photon, and this automatically finds uh, the best matching local oscillator shape to match the shape of, local, uh, of a single photon. 
Uh, and then uh, once you have done this, uh, you can use uh, just uh, some classical analysis tools like uh, frog uh, autocorrelations and so on to measure the shape of a local oscillator, and that's uh, the best uh, match to the shape of your single photon. Okay, so we did this uh, several ways. Uh, so, for example, you can just take your single photons and put them, send them through a piece of glass. And so these are short pulses, so short uh, weight packet modes. And uh, what you expect is that uh, you, you, you get dispersion at the output. And so you, we run the algorithm, and then when it converges, we can just uh, essentially analyze uh, the shape of a local oscillator. And this is what we find. So this is a spectral phase, a nice a quadratic spectral phase, which tells you that your single photons are now broadened in time, okay? And then you can do something more complex. Uh, so you can, instead of just shaping, sorry, mm, yeah, shaping your photon, you can shape the pump, which generates single photons. So for example, you can do it with a microcentrometer, which puts some sinusoidal spectral modulation in the pump. And you can, for example, do something like this. So this is a spectral modulation given by the microcentrometer. And you can narrow the spectrum of the pump this way. And what you get is that the spectrum of single photon is narrowed. So now it has a spectral, a flat spectral, spectral phase, but it has narrowed spectrum, and which means that uh, so your single, you can manipulate this, the shape of your single photon, and you can also put it the other way around with the minimum at this, with a zero at the maximum of the uh, pump uh, spectrum. And in this case, uh, your pump will will have a double uh, peak. Uh, structure, and if you do this, also your single photons will have a double peak, uh, spectral peak uh, structure. So you, this is uh, the result of uh, again uh, the algorithm. After uh, convergence, you see that uh, spectrally your single photon has a double peak, and you can also measure the, the spectral phases between these two uh, peaks. And you can think of it as a spectral qubit. So your single photon is, uh, you can think of it as in a coherent superposition of two spectral modes, okay? And so in principle, you can use this to encode uh, information in the spectral uh, mode of a single photon. Okay, and then, now almost finished, you can also use some other ways to, to, to manipulate the shape of your single photons. So for example, instead of using just a piece of glass, you can use a a cell with some resonant uh, vapors. And so you can send your single photons, which have this, uh, initially they have this nice uh, Gaussian uh, wave packet mode through this uh, resonant uh, atomic gas and see what comes out. If, uh, so in classical uh, optics, uh, this is a, a well-known uh, problem. You, ultra short pulses interaction with uh, Resonant gases, uh, they produce a so-called, uh, uh, there is a uh, area theorem and so on. And in particular, in some, uh, when the, in, let's say, uh, the uh, intensity of initial pulse is low enough, you have a formation of so-called zero uh, pi uh, pulses. I'm not going to, to explain what it is, but what we expect in a classical way is that, uh, so this is a rubinium in this case, which is resonant with this one, but the bandwidth of a single photon is much larger than the bandwidth of resonance band absorption bandwidth of, the, of rubidium. So you don't expect essentially any absorption, but you expect a strong modulation of a shape. And in classical, let's say, physics, so you, you explain it with a first, uh, the absorption of the pulse, of, of the first part of the pulse by the gas, then real re-emission by the atoms in, in the gas, which is out of phase, with the incoming pulse, so what you expect to see is a sort of a modulation of a temporal shape of the of the pulse uh, as it passes through the, uh, the atoms. So, can we see the same with a single photon? So, uh, with a single photon, it's difficult to think about uh, successive absorption, re-emissions, uh, uh, cycles uh, uh, by 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 the atoms, but uh, so. This is a question. Can we really see something like this coming out? And uh, so we, we can do the experiment and gain 
what we can do. If it's uh, uh, your rubidium gas is at uh, low temperature, you don't expect any change uh, in the shape of a, of a single photon. And so what you can do is to scan your local oscillator. Now you don't, put, mm, your local oscillator is still short. And you can use it as a probe at different delays. So if uh, at low temperature you expect uh, your single photon to not be modulated. So what you see, what we get indeed, is a single peak as we scan the local oscillator, short local oscillator, uh, through the uh, single photon uh, profile. But at high temperature, we, when the density of atoms inside the cell increases, then you expect your single photon to be modulated more or less like this. And then by, if you scan your local oscillator, you will see that the fraction of a single photon at different times is, uh, is different. And this is indeed what we see. So this is a scan of a delay between the local oscillator and short local oscillator, which is a sort of probe, which uh, tells you what is the fraction of single photon at different times. Okay, and so you see that uh, as you increase the temperature, you, 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 see, you really see these modulations. But this doesn't tell you much. It doesn't tell you if your single photon is still a single photon, it's just an incoherent mix, mixture of single photons at different delays. So if you want to do that, uh, and again, if you, if you do this at some, essentially you lose your single photon. You measure, you measure it at some point, at some high temperatures, and if your mode, local oscillator mode is not matched to the mode of a single photon, you lose it. So this is a positive Wigner function, okay? But can we recover it? And the idea is that, okay, you can just uh, place the right shape here with this uh, pulse shaper, and you can just write the, what you expect for the shape of your single photon. So if you want to pass from this situation where the single photon and the the local oscillator and the single photon are not matched to this situation where they are perfectly matched. And uh, so we can do it. Can we find this single photon if we look at the right place, so in the right mode? And the answer is yes, of course. So you see this is the situation before when, uh, let's see, at this temperature it was almost, it was, uh, the efficiency was 40%, so it, there's no more negativity here, so it's essentially lost. If we use the right shape for the local oscillator here, we see that the efficiency goes up back to 60%, which is what we normally get. And so you find again negativity of the Wigner function. So indeed, we are able to, 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 to measure the single photon and to prove that it's still a single photon, even if it's in a highly modulated uh, temporal mode after the interaction. Okay, I think this is all. And uh, so, these are the conclusions, and the main conclusion is that, okay, so that playing with the quantum light, uh, both in, uh, uh, in the state of quantum light and the mode of quantum light is uh, fun, because, uh, I mean, you can arbitrarily engineer the states and the modes, you can implement very, let's say, in principle, complex quantum operation, and you can perform quite textbook type experiments. I mean, really measuring the commutation uh, relationship in the lab is something that Nice. And uh, so it's fun, but uh, it also probably will be useful at some point because, I mean, you can combine these uh, boxes in different ways and maybe you can find new ideas and new tools for quantum technologies. So these are the people who in the several years have been working on this. So these are people who have been in the lab along uh, these years and these three here are still in the lab. And these are some of our theoretical collaborators, and thank you very much. That's all. Thank you very much. So we have a very short time for one or two questions, please. Is there? You written like alpha plus alpha orthogonal. Yeah. Yeah, what is the analytical form of alpha orthogonal? Oh, in this particular case, it's, uh, the alpha orthogonal is just a, a displaced Fox state. You know, it's a, it's a single photon Fox state 
displaced in the phase space in that particular case if you apply that particular orthogonalizer. But then it depends on the input state and the orthogonalizer that you use and so on. Yeah. And the second one about the, uh, detecting the shape of the signal, uh, the model shape. Uh, Mm, it looks for me that uh, this uh, coefficient eta is uh, just the projection of your uh, signal to a local oscillator form. Uh, and uh, why don't you, instead of making this genetic algorithm, just make projection of some kind of uh, Chebyshev or mite basis or something like that, and make like maximum like the hood reconstruction? Oh, okay. Uh, yes, I'm not saying that this is the best way of doing it. Yeah, probably there are better ways of doing it. Yes, we adopted this uh, genetic algorithm because it was uh, something that we could uh, more or less easily uh, do in the lab, and it was uh, we were interested in this one, in this particular approach. But uh, yes, maybe there are, of course, better ones. I don't know. Thank you. Interesting talk. Uh, my question is from the experiment point of view. Mm -hmm. What is the frequency of the good events uh, in your experiment with quantum operations? So yeah. Okay. So we our laser source is a Moodlock laser. So it's a, it's a sending pulses at 80 megahertz repetition rate. Okay. If you're talking about uh, photon addition, that depends on the as I told, showed you, the, the probability of a photon addition depends on the number, mean number of photons in the input state. Okay, suppose it's just single photon generation, so it starts from vacuum. So it can be up to, to 10 kilohertz, that's more or less the maximum. Photon subtraction, again, to, 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 to do it uh, in a good way, in a high fidelity way, you have to keep the uh, reflectivity of the beam splitter low enough. But that's easy. I mean, you can keep 1% or 2 or 3% with at 80 megahertz, so it, that does not limit uh, the, uh, the rate too much. Yeah, but if you start to put some of these boxes one after the other, of course, the, yeah, the rate, rate drops. Okay, thank you very much, Marco. You're welcome. <laughs>